currently serves as Vice President for Care Management and Outcomes at Health Alliance Plan and as Medical Director for HAP Midwest Health Plan, a HAP subsidiary. At HAP, Dr. Watson oversees 90 personnel, including nurses, social workers, and support staff who provide care management, disease management, and transitions of care for HAP members enrolled in government programs, including Medicaid Advantage, I'm sorry, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid and Medicare, Medi- Medicaid plans. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs> As medical director for HAP Midwest Health Plan, he also provides operational leadership for the Michigan Health Link Med- Medicare, Medicaid demonstration program, provider management, compliance, and accreditation programs. He also serves as the organization's medical liaison with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Michigan Association of Health Plans. He is board certified in internal medicine with focused practice in hospital medicine. Dr. Watson has had leadership roles in many hospital quality initiatives across Henry Ford Health System, including improving collaborative practices in the hospital, standardization of observation medicine practices, and promoting high-quality palliative and health end of life care. Woo. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Watson. <laughs> you got all that in one breath. That's I good. Did. <laughs> so Dr. Watson, um, most parents want to do what is best for their children. They buy car seats, they baby-proof their homes, and take action to make sure their children are safe. Yet many are not aware that one of the best ways to protect your children is to make sure they have all of their vaccinations. Why is it so important for parents to have their children vaccinated? Well, Angela, I'm glad you brought up the whole issue of baby proofing. I'm a I'm a father of three boys and can remember when they were first born and thought about how I protected them in the house and car seats and such. Immunizations really are one of the best way we can protect our children uh, from over a dozen different diseases, uh, many of which can put children in the hospital or even kill them uh, in under the worst circumstances. It is one of the best insurance policies you can use uh, to try to reduce the risk of serious illness to children. Mm -hmm. Now, in our conversation prior to the show, I mentioned that many parents unconsciously only think about the safety of their own children, failing to realize that failure to have their children vaccinated can pose a risk to other children. Can you talk about the increased risk of spreading illness in non-vaccinated children? Absolutely. I think uh, immunizations obviously protect our own children on an individual basis, but they, they help develop what I like to call community immunity. So they help bolster the uh, protection of children in the community uh, from transmitting serious illnesses from one another. Uh, And so by all parents really committing to immunizing their children, they actually protect the children of their neighbors as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, according to the CDC, a prolonged illness caused by a vaccine-preventable disease can take a financial toll on a family because of lost time at work for the parents to care for the sick child, medical bills, or even long-term disability care. How can you as a physician emphasize to parents how immunizations can save both time and money? Actually, I think that's a great point and one that's often run unrecognized. We think about the most serious complications of uh, immunized illness, uh, and we don't think about the everyday issues that occur, uh, particularly for busy working parents who may have one or more children in the household. So by immunizing uh, your children against uh, the more common Uh, illnesses, uh, you can reduce the risk of them just getting sick at home, which means folks have to take time off work or have to get babysitters or such to keep them at home or can't bring them to daycare because, of course, once they get a fever, they're out for a day or two Mm -hmm. uh, before they get better. So it does save a considerable amount of time and money uh, for parents, uh, particularly busy working parents, Mm -hmm. uh, if they immunize their children. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a number of misconceptions about the safety and effectiveness of vaccinations in young children. What advice do you have for parents who do not want to get their children vaccinated because they are concerned about the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccine? So uh, I think like any medical treatment, you have to think about what is the benefit of a treatment versus what's the potential side effect. And Mm -hmm. vaccines aren't without some minor side effects. The vast majority of those side effects are very minor Mm -hmm. and self-limited. Usually they're over within about 24 to 48 hours of a vaccine. Most common uh, side effects for both children and for adults who get vaccinated are maybe a slightly mild elevated temperature, some Mm -hmm. soreness at the injection site, sometimes some muscle soreness. 
These are actually all indications that the vaccine is working. Okay. Uh, vaccines all cause a minor immune reaction to help you build antibodies to that disease. Mm -hmm. And so actually that side effect is uh, often a common and necessary step for the vaccine to do its work. The more, uh, some of the more um, concerning side effects that people talk about, but really the evidence does not support a risk of are things like autism. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to spend a second to talk about autism, this was first published in the literature in the late 1990s in Britain. Uh, there was a particular uh, investigator in Britain who did a series of studies. These are very small scale studies that uh, lended some potential relationship between autism and vaccination. Mm -hmm. So later found out that the way those studies was constructed was really not very effective. And in fact, uh, the the journal where those studies were published, The Lancet uh, in England, fully retracted all those studies uh, mm -hmm. early in the early 2000s. It was very unfortunate. It has led to a persistent belief that autism uh, is caused by these vaccines. There's absolutely no evidence to support that. And in fact, a number of studies that have been done after those studies done in the 90s to show that there is no relationship between mm -hmm. vaccines and autism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time to go through that in such detail. Because I think that is probably the um, most common misconception that I've heard. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the concerns that people have about vaccinations because they don't understand immunity and how vaccines are a way to give children immunity to a disease with the, without them having to get sick first. Can you explain to my listeners how vaccines actually work to protect the body against the diseases that can attack it? Absolutely. So um, I think a lot of times people think that it might be more effective for a child to get sick with an illness and get what's called natural immunity or acquired immunity from that illness mm -hmm. versus actually getting the vaccine. And we have numerous studies to show that actually vaccines create just as effective level of immunity um, in children as would be acquiring that illness. The way vaccines work is typically there are two general types of vaccine, either a weakened virus Mm -hmm. um, or actually a synthetic virus, one that's made in the lab to make it look like the outer shell of a virus that you're protecting against. Okay. And basically by injecting that small amount of material, the body is tricked into thinking that it actually has an infection when indeed uh, the body does not. And so the body generates proteins called antibodies. These are basically little pieces of protein that latch on to viruses when they, they come in contact later in life. Mm -hmm. And that activates the body's system to kill that virus and clear it uh, from the system. Uh, so basically the bottom line is, is that vaccines sort of temporarily trick the body into mm -hmm. thinking it's infected. Those are some of those side effects I mentioned earlier, that low temp, that muscle ache. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the body now generates these proteins that then stay in the body forever mm -hmm. um, and actually watch for virus when you come in contact with it again. Mm, that's amazing. What um, vaccines do you recommend recommend for um, young children? Like what are standard? Sure. So there are actually a number of uh, viruses that we try to protect against uh, throughout the early part of life. Uh, so for children, uh, some of the more common diseases that we protect against are hepatitis B, okay. uh, which is a serious virus which can uh, cause a lot of damage to the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, rotavirus, which is actually a common virus that causes diarrhea in children. Uh, and then we actually have a series of viruses that all cause pneumonia, things like haemophilus, pneumonia, um, pertussis. Uh, these are pertussis is whooping cough. That's sort yeah. of the one that we hear about a lot. Yeah. Those all cause very serious respiratory uh, or lung-related uh, infections. Uh, probably the one that um, I grew up with as a kid but is now really not very common is varicella or chickenpox. Okay. So yeah. my three boys are all vaccinated against varicella have never had to take care of them with chicken pox. Um, and then finally, you have uh, some other diseases, uh, meningitis, uh, you might hear about, which is an infection of uh, sort of the spinal cord and brain that can be a very serious infection, mm -hmm. uh, which we do uh, vaccinate against in childhood, uh, as well as, again, some other pneumonia, measles, mumps, rubella. Those typically also cause lung-related diseases. So there are about 14 different disorders uh, that we can vaccinate against pretty effectively. And these vaccines are anywhere from 70 upwards to 80% effective in reducing the risk of contracting the illness. Okay. Now you said 70 to 80%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So, and again, that still means that folks might still get infected with the disease, even if they've been vaccinated, mm-hmm. but their risk to them is substantially reduced. So they might still have a very small infection, but actually not even feel it. Okay. Okay. Now, are you able to speak to the actual schedule of vaccinations? Yes. So um, there's actually a pretty in-depth schedule. This actually gets reviewed on an annual basis. Uh, your pediatrician, typically, when you're taking your children in, will definitely make sure that you stay on schedule. Pediatricians know this uh, by heart. Uh, <laughs> typically, in the first 12 to 14 months of life is where the majority of children will get their vaccines. Uh, some of those will be as early as birth, with most of these falling within the first two to eight months of life. Uh, And so those first few well baby checks after birth are critically important Mm -hmm. uh, because that's when children are going to be getting a large number of their vaccines. So somewhere between four and six of those vaccines are going to be given at about two months old, uh, followed by another set of boosters at four months, six months. Usually at the one year mark is where there's another group of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And then it typically will stretch out at about two years, four years and six years with some additional boosters. And of course, at six months and above, every year, children should be getting the flu vaccine. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're going to discuss that flu vaccine yes. in more detail definitely later. Now, much of our discussion today has been on the importance of vaccinations for young children. However, I've learned that there are vaccinations that older children should receive as well. I would like you to take a moment to talk about some of those important vaccines for preteens and teens. Absolutely. So, Once children get uh, into their preteen years, typically around 10 or 11 years old, um, the next uh, vaccine that will be introduced uh, is something called the HPV vaccine, Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for what's called human papillomavirus. There's a whole set of viruses in this family uh, that have been shown to lead to cervical cancer, Mm -hmm. which is a a very devastating cancer. This is a, a very unique vaccine in the sense that this is one of our first vaccines that got put out to actually prevent cancer. Uh, This was originally rolled out for uh, young women, young girls, um, at the age of 10 or 11, uh, but has actually been extended uh, to boys. Um, And in fact, again, uh, my my boys will be vaccinated for this as well. One of them already is. So this is actually a critical vaccine because it attacks this virus um, before, as people are exposed, prevents it from spreading Mm -hmm. and prevents young women from getting Uh, human papillomavirus or cervical cancer later in life. There is a relationship also between human papillomavirus and certain types of genital warts in both men and women. So Mm -hmm. it's meant to protect them from that as well. Uh, Rarely, human papillomavirus actually can lead to more serious infections like respiratory infections, Mm -hmm. but we're really trying to prevent cancer here. Other uh, types of vaccines that teens get Meningitis uh, typically will get boosted uh, in the teenage years, as will another booster for measles, mumps, rubella. This is actually a very important booster for MMR Mm -hmm. because we actually have a lot of outbreaks of both measles and meningitis in college age. So we want to try to get them vaccinated in their teenage years before they go off to college. Uh, So for you parents out there that are getting your children packed up and ready to go, Uh, to go in the fall to their college. Remember, close quarters, in dorms, other things, that's where diseases can get spread. And so we do worry about measles and meningitis uh, in that population, as well as flu. Okay, okay. Now I want to go back a little bit because you, I believe you mentioned with the human papillomavirus vaccine that that was um, primarily targeted towards girls. Is this something that, was there more research or studies that came across it, you know, where they start to gear it towards uh, males as well? Yes, and I think the issue there is is that men, um, as they age, if they've been exposed to human papillomavirus, although they may not, they're obviously not at risk for things like cervical cancer, right. they can carry the virus. Okay. So when they have sexual contact later on in life, they can actually expose uh, young women to that. So by vaccinating men or young boys as well as young girls, uh, we are trying to actually do whatever we can to reduce Uh, the penetration of that virus in our community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I believe you said in our discussion prior to the show, when we talked on the phone a couple days ago, that that is the one um, vaccination that a lot of parents don't like to talk about. Yes. uh, Because it has to do with sex. Correct. Yes. And, of course, this is always a sensitive topic because 
You do have to explain to your children why it is you're giving them this vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, and pediatricians um, try to handle that conversation very respectfully with parents to explain what that means because children will ask, well, what what is this protecting me against, uh, mm -hmm. as they should. And so that that might create the need for that conversation if it has not already taken place uh, with your child. And again, um, there is some flexibility as to the age of when this vaccine is given, but typically we do like to try to get this vaccine to both young boys and young girls by about 11 or 12, no later than that, because we do know from studies that uh, sexual relations can be occurring very early on. Mm -hmm. And we want to get that vaccine to them uh, before they may get exposed to that virus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I can see definitely steps have, are being taken to to try to educate the public about the importance of the human papillomavirus vaccine. I see commercials almost daily about that very subject. So I'm, I'm hoping that parents will be inspired <laughs> yes. to uh, move into action and protect their kids. Now, um, you mentioned meningitis. Is how common is meningitis outbreaks in college? So meningitis outbreaks actually can be quite, um, they're not frequent, but mm -hmm. they're, they're common enough, um, particularly in closed quarters. So the, the classic places where meningitis can be at risk for spreading are college campuses, closed quarters where folks are sharing small spaces. Actually, a lot of our early studies around meningitis were in the military uh, oh, because, because military recruits are in very close, cramped uh, barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another actually risky group uh, in the sense because um, there are large communities of folks in small buildings. Uh, so usually you'll hear about these things in the news at very specific campuses. We've had some outbreaks in Michigan uh, over the last few years. Uh, meningitis is a treatable uh, bacterial infection, uh, but any way that we can reduce the risk of people getting it in the first place uh, is certainly much better. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I've heard about the military. Yes. I, I, you know, all the commercials are always typically geared towards college-age children. Right, um, but same age group. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, yes, it mm -hmm. would be. Yeah, in close quarters, I, I get that. Um, let me ask you uh, another question. Now, you mentioned um, with the human papillomavirus, I just wanted to go over that mm -hmm. for a moment. You mentioned uh, the high high incidence of genital warts. Mm -hmm. it's, is that something that's associated with the human papillomavirus? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And in fact, um, for the vaccines that we're giving, and, and these vaccines are constantly being looked at to include more strains of the human papillomavirus to make them even more effective. So initially, the strongest relationship was with cervical cancer. But then there's a recognition that these things are also leading to genital warts as well, which do affect both men and women. So that, that sort of expanded the opportunity to try to reduce um, the, the effect of this virus on the general population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for going back. And mm -hmm. that, I, that was something that I remember you mentioning, but yep. I didn't really um, highlight it. So I thought it important to do that for the listeners. So we have about a minute, but I, I'm just going to tell you what we're going to kind of go into um, following the break. Now, according to the CDC, you never outgrow the need for vaccines. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice recommends vaccines for adults 19 years and older. I know we have been primarily talking about um, kids uh, college age as well as preteens and teens, but it appears that there are specific recommendations for people ages eight, 19 to 26 and then over age 50. Um, when we get back from the break and we can talk about it, we'll go into the break. I want you to talk about she just some of those vaccinations, okay? This Absolutely. is the Angela Moore of Empowered on 9 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. No limits, she craves attention, she praises an image, she prays to be. 9 10 a.m. Superstation, giving you exactly what you need by any means necessary. Thank you for calling 9 10 a.m. Superstation. What's your question or comment? We got D on line one. What up, D? Why should Maxine Waters be held at such high standards when the president of the United States say any and everything? And nobody, you know, we say it, but like all this, like she needs to get out of office and all that, and everybody respect her. But how long do we have to keep on keeping on? We need some action. We need something to change. We need we need to set an example. We, we got to show something, Mike. We got to set a standard. We, we, we can't We've been doing it for so long. We've been doing the same thing, getting the same result that we've been getting. That's insanity. Now to do something different. Don't stop. Keep calling and make sure your voice gets heard. Call in and chime in on the conversation. Take down the number and lock us in your speed dial. It's 313-209-9000. That's 313-209-9000.
You're struggling with your mortgage. You think about it all the time. What are we gonna do if we lose the house? It's time to stop thinking and start dialing. Call 1-888-995-HOPE for a free government program that offers expert one-on-one -on -one advice about your mortgage options. We've helped over a million homeowners and we want to help you. Call 1-888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. 910 AM Superstation is in a league of its own. We are the only talk radio station in the metro Detroit area sensitive to the African-American community. Make sure you join us on what station? 910 AM, the Superstation. 910 AM. 910 AM. On 910 AM, Superstation. 910 AM Superstation, Metro Detroit's only African-American-based talk radio station. She just wants to be beautiful. She goes unnoticed. She knows no limits. She craves attention. She praises an image. She prays to be more of a part on 9 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. Please tune in every Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. Call 313-778-7600 if you want to join in on the conversation today. 9 10 a.m. Superstation will broadcast live from Hunter's House Hamburgers at 35,075 Woodward in Birmingham, Wednesday through Dream Cruise Saturday, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. daily. Come out and join 9 10 a.m. Superstation at Hunter House Hamburgers on Woodward in Birmingham as we ramp up for the Dream Cruise 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. starting Wednesday through Saturday daily. So, Dr. Peter Watson, we're back. <laughs> so I, I mentioned um, prior to the break that um, it appears that there are specific recommendations for people ages 19 to 26 and over age 50. I want to talk about um, the vaccinations that occur during this, these time periods and why they are so important. Absolutely. So uh, I think that the 19... Um, to 26 up to the 50-year-old age range has, has sort of been that age group that some folks thought, oh, geez, I don't need to get any immunization. So, mm -hmm. again, I know we're going to talk about it a little later, but absolutely annual flu vaccine is essential in this age group. This is a very active working group. Uh, often these are folks who are starting to have children, so we want to keep them well mm -hmm. uh, and not get their children sick. Um, because children under the age of six months cannot be vaccinated from flu. So we want to make sure that their parents are vaccinated. Uh, some other vaccines to be thinking about are boosters for tetanus uh, and for pertussis. Again, um, the, the importance for pertussis, uh, this is very important in young, young adults who are of childbearing age with young children at home mm -hmm. uh, because this, again, is something that can infect their children or that they may get from their children. Uh, this will also become important later on for uh, grandparents uh, over the age of 65. Uh, I think we already talked a little bit about a measles booster. Usually that's going to be before college age, mm -hmm. around 19. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some of the things that we would be looking at in sort of that healthy, a young adult population. The other uh, vaccines that we would think about, these are typically only in young adults who are at risk, who have chronic illness. But we do have some young adults in the community who may have asthma. They may have lung disease. They may have uh, immune conditions they actually may be asked by their physician to accelerate some of their immunization that would normally be after the age of 50, mm -hmm. um, but they will get them younger in life because they have a predisposition to illness. Uh, that's a very small percentage of the population, again, one that your doctor would be uh, keeping you in line with. Okay, okay. Now, last year, and we've been kind of alluding to this um, big topic I'm getting ready to go into, the flu. Last year's flu season was considered one of the worst seasons in 10 years hospitalizations from the flu increase as well as serious and in some instances fatal complications as a result of the flu. What do you recommend when it comes to getting the flu shot? I'm going to say one quick word about the flu. Um, 2018 is now the 100th anniversary of the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. This was actually, and I think it's a good lesson for us in history, uh, nearly 100 million people across the globe died from flu in 1918, many in Michigan. Uh, in fact, my home hospital, Henry Ford Hospital, was a, um, a primary site for managing flu in 1918, just a year and a half after it had opened. Wow. Uh, and so when we think about how far we have come in the management of flu, we have to look back in history to see how devastating it was. The, the Earth lost 5% of its population 
in the 1918 flu pandemic. Whoa. Uh, and so when I talk to patients about the importance of flu vaccine, I give them a little history lesson and explain that flu vaccine has been one of the single biggest uh, medical interventions to save life uh, in the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so every year, the importance of people getting flu vaccine, I think, is incredibly important because it really helps us save lives mm -hmm. um, and helps people uh, prevent them from getting an illness that they'll never know, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Or at least if they get flu, they get it in a very weakened state. Uh, and so the importance of that flu vaccine, I think, is incredibly important. Sorry for the, the history lesson no, there, but I, I think it's important please, for people no, to know that. No, I think that's a really important thing to so, share. The flu season that we just finished, uh, which actually officially ended in late spring in May by the Center for Disease Control, uh, was one of the worst flu seasons on record. In fact, we had more uh, pediatric deaths, child, uh, children dying from flu than at any other time since pediatric deaths have been measured. Mm -hmm. uh, we had over 170 pediatric deaths. Uh, we had an, uh, thousands and thousands of people who were hospitalized and people who lost their lives from flu. And the majority of these people were unvaccinated, mm -hmm. uh, particularly children. Eighty percent of the over 170 children who died from flu uh, did not get a vaccine for mm -hmm. flu. And um, as a physician and as a parent, um, that troubles me greatly. So whatever we can do uh, for Health Alliance Plan, for other health systems in the area to promote flu vaccination, uh, it's going to be a very big effort for us this year. We want to boost uh, the percentage of people vaccinated as high as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about the flu shot. Some people believe that it can make you get the flu and that you don't have to get it every year. Can the flu vaccine make you get the flu, and why is it necessary to get the flu shot every year? Right. Well, just as we talked about earlier about immunity and how immunity actually works, um, the way the flu shot works is that actually uh, the Center for Disease Control looks at the types of flu that people were afflicted with uh, in the prior season and actually creates a flu vaccine that makes it appear that that is the flu. So when it's injected in folks, it actually sort of tricks the body into thinking they have the flu when they really don't. Mm -hmm. So it's usually a weakened flu or actually a synthetic wrap of what the flu looks like. It doesn't really infect you with the flu itself. It does generate an immune reaction, so you'll have a little bit of temperature. You'll have a stiff arm at the injection site. Mm -hmm. You might be a little bit stiff uh, in the arm. That is your body reacting to that vaccine and creating antibodies, which will then protect you against flu later that season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I just want to reiterate, but that is a sign that the vaccine's actually working, Correct. right? <laughs> yes, it is. Now, in our conversation um, prior to the show, we were actually um, talking about some of the uh, amazing information that's available online that people can freely assess, you know, assess, that's accessible to people that, you know, educate you about the flu, the importance of vaccinations. Can you um, just refer some of the listeners to some of those great websites? Absolutely. So probably the best website that is continually updated on a national level is from the Centers of Disease Control. Uh, it is found at cdc.gov backslash flu, mm -hmm. F-L-U. Uh, actually, Health Alliance Plan actually already has a flu website, which we update throughout the year as well. And we typically will refer to the Centers uh, for Disease Control website. So that's at hap.org backslash flu. So there are actually a number of resources out there. If you Google flu facts, mm -hmm. you will find a number of very reputable uh, national and local resources. The, Mich the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has an updated flu uh, website. Most of those sites uh, should refer back to the Centers for Disease Control website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one of the things that we also talked about um, as I was looking at that website, and you were actually explaining, and I think it's really important for listeners to hear this. Now, how do you, how does whoever does the flu vaccine determine what type of flu vaccine they create for the year? Because I thought that was very interesting to hear. Right. So it's it's a very um, it's a very complex uh, exercise. We have scientists, largely at the Centers for Disease Control, joined by global disease entities across the globe that analyze um, flu cases uh, nationally and globally mm -hmm. to determine the trends and the types of flu strains that are out there. We can't possibly vaccinate against every possible flu strain in existence. So a little bit of this is math to determine what's the highest chance of you getting infected. And typically, 
the flu vaccine, which is now in the process of being distributed nationally, mm-hmm. um, it contains somewhere between three and, f- and four flu strains that are going to be the most commonly um, found in the environment based on last year's data. Uh, and in fact, just of note for your listeners, uh, one of the strains that will be in this year's flu vaccine is a strain from Michigan. Uh, oh, and is, it is named okay. after Michigan. Um, and is a strain that was determined to be quite common. Uh, Strains get named for where they're first found. Uh, So it wasn't just in Michigan. It was all over the country, but that's where it was first isolated. So uh, you could say that the flu has a little bit of a local flavor this year. Uh, When you get your vaccine, you can think that, um, you know, Michigan (laughs) sort of contributed to that. Um, So this is a very complex um, sort of calculations that go on all over the world. There's strains um, that are protected against from Asia, uh, from Colorado. Mm -hmm. And so those are all formulated together, um, made over a several month period of time in very rapid fashion, and then distributed all over the country and all over the world uh, to be given in clinics, uh, in pharmacies, wherever they can be given in public health departments. Uh, so that that vaccine has already been manufactured, and it's in the process of making its way to your doctor's office probably by Labor Day. Mm-hmm. Now, can you explain again why it's so important to get your vaccination, your flu vaccination? Absolutely, every year? <laughs> absolutely. So every year you need to get your vaccine. Um, really, so important because the flu leads to so many hospitalizations. It can lead to death, certainly in high risk groups and young children. Uh, and in the very old. And by vaccinating yourself, you protect yourself. But as we said earlier, you help protect others in the community. The more people who get vaccinated, the lesser the risk that we're going to transmit flu all over in the community. So really our goal nationally Mm -hmm. is to get 80% of the community vaccinated. Statistically, if you can get 80% of a community vaccinated, you, you dramatically reduce the risk of that being transmitted. Uh, Think about today's Sunday, if you were in church and there were 100 people in church, Mm -hmm. if 80 of those 100 were vaccinated, um, you only have 20 people. Well, the chances of those 20 people all being next to each other or next to somebody who's unvaccinated goes down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. If only half of those people were vaccinated, there's a lot more people next to one another that could be transmitting the virus to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about how vaccination helps protect yourself and others around you. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's, in, you know, I think about that term you use, com- community-based immunity, and that is the goal, correct? Absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, in, in addition to the flu vaccine, what other vaccinations should older individuals receive? So once you get to about the age of 50 and above, uh, that's where a couple more vaccines come in. Um, uh, probably the first one that would get introduced to you at the age of 50 would be uh, the shingles vaccine. Mm. Uh, And we've actually been very fortunate. Shingles is a a very um, uncomfortable disorder. It is typically not lethal. It doesn't cause death, uh, but it can cause great debility. It's basically a reactivation of chicken pox. Mm -hmm. Uh, When when we all got chicken pox uh, before the vaccine came out, uh, now our children are vaccinated against chicken pox. (laughs) We actually got chicken pox. We cleared it, but it actually went dormant in our spinal cord, and it stayed there. Okay. And so what happens is once you cross the age of 50 and older, your immunity naturally gets a little bit more weakened. And okay. so then chicken pox reactivates into what's called shingles, basically a blistering rash, usually on one side of the body. It can be anywhere on the body, on the legs, on the trunk, um, on the chest, uh, or it can even go to the face. Um, mm-hmm. And it can cause severe pain. Uh, it can cause problems with vision, with hearing, with other things. Uh, and we now have a vaccine uh, that can prevent that. There's actually a new vaccine that's out now, um, Mm -hmm. which is a two-shot regimen started at the age of 50, and it can actually reduce the risk of shingles by over 90%. This is one of our most effective vaccines um, out there. Uh, And so I really would urge a lot of folks who are 50 and above, I got a few more years before I can get my shingles vaccine, (laughs) but I'm I'm looking forward to it um, because I've taken care of many patients with shingles, and it's a devastating um, a de- devastating disease. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, some other disorders, again, we've already talked about flu. Uh, as folks get a little bit older into their 50s and 60s, we also talk about pneumonia vaccine. Okay. Again, like flu, pneumonia vaccines are formulated to protect you against the most 10 to 15 most common types of bacterial pneumonia. Okay. Um, again, a highly effective vaccine. Typically, you only have to get one dose of this, and then you do have lifetime protection. Uh, And again, community-acquired bacterial pneumonia 
is another disorder that affects a lot of people in the community, can make them very sick or hospitalized, and can lead to death. Now, I want to go back to the shingles vaccine because yes. one of the things that I noticed that you mentioned was that the this newer um, vaccine that you have, that you said is, is, hum, is 80, 90%? Over 90% Over effective. 90% effective, mm-hmm. whereas the previous one was? Uh, closer to about 60%. Mm-hmm. 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 So still a very good vaccine. The older vaccine, uh, the Zostavax vaccine, came out several years ago, about 60% effective. It is, that's a one-dose mm-hmm. vaccine. Uh, the newer vaccine, which goes under the brand name Shingrix, uh, that's a two-dose regimen. Um, so one or the other is, is fine. I would prefer, and the government has issued a preference uh, for the two-shot regiment. Nobody likes to get two shots if they can get away with one. But you increase the percentage. Absolutely. Percent. Yes. Yep. It's uh, it's a much better protection. Uh, and I know at, at Health Alliance Plan, we are really trying to get the word out for people to get Shingrix. And actually, if you've already gotten the Zoster vaccine earlier, mm-hmm. you can actually get this newer vaccine. Oh, so you can get both. You can. You do have to wait a little bit, about six months, if you've already been vaccinated with the older vaccine. Okay. uh, Just to give your immune system time to sort of recover and really see this new vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, But if if you have not yet been exposed to shingles and you've been vaccinated, you can go back to your doctor and say, should I be a candidate for this newer vaccine? Mm -hmm. You know, I want to just kind of highlight uh, some of the symptoms of shingles because I think I think with pneumonia, people are aware of the symptoms of pneumonia. But I think with shingles, unless you've known someone that's been affected by shingles, you probably underestimate the intensity of these symptoms. Yes. And I believe I, I had mentioned to you in our conversation previously that I know of you know several people that have had shingles, and they describe the symptoms to be extremely, extremely painful. Um, and one incident I will share with you, uh, one of my clients' fathers had shingles, and he actually had it on his face, and it moved into his eye, and he was left with a very uh, horrible scar, and he was scarred for the rest of his life. And so, can you just kind of highlight some of those symptoms, so those people that may be on the edge of whether or not they wanted to get a shingles vaccination will be inspired to move? <laughs> Absolutely, I would not wish shingles on anyone. It's it's a terrible disorder. Again, typically not life threatening, but very debilitating. Uh, typically, as the virus reactivates, um, you get a, a a blistering rash on one side of the body. It can go to the face, uh, and it can affect multiple levels. Uh, the blisters occur, and then even after the blisters are gone, if you and most people will clear the infection on their own, mm-hmm. the nerves in the face or in the affected part of the body will remain inflamed sometimes for many, many months. And uh, patients who I've taken care of who have it, describe it as sort of a shooting, burning pain, almost on a constant basis. Uh, It can actually impede people's ability to be physically active. Uh, It can cause scarring, uh, so it can be a little bit disfiguring. Um, In rare circumstances, it can go into the eye and can cause blindness uh, in that eye if not treated uh, quickly. Uh, And then in some rare circumstances, if it's near the point of the ear, it can cause hearing impediment uh, as well. So uh, it is one of those diseases that can cause very significant disability, even long after the body has cleared it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, now we've talked about vaccinations for, you know, uh, young people as well as, you know, your preteens and teens and going into the older population. Is there any um, thing that I did not ask you about that you think it's important to cover? So one more vaccine that I will talk about, and I call this the grandparent vaccine, okay. uh, and that is to make sure um, that those over the age of 65, we already talked about uh, zoster, we talked about pneumonia, but pertussis. Pertussis, So okay. Or whooping cough. So uh, you may have heard me talk about earlier in the segment about pertussis vaccine. This is called the Tdap, the TDAP mm-hmm. uh, vaccine. Uh, this is very important for children. Whooping cough is a disorder where the lungs constrict. Uh, and can cause serious pneumonia and actually a high-pitched sort of whooping sound, uh, thus the the term whooping cough. The reason I call it the grandparent vaccine is Mm -hmm. is that as people age, they lose some immunity to pertussis, even if they've been vaccinated earlier in life. And it's the grandparents that are taking care of the grandchildren when the parents are at work. And so actually, we have seen um, older adults in their 60s and 70s come down with pertussis because they have lost immunity and have typically gotten it from the young children that they were taking care of. So um, this is one of those vaccines where older folks might think, well, geez, I'm not going to get pertussis. That's something a young kid gets. But you have to remember, again, this gets back to community immunity. 
you are always in contact with people who may be harboring this illness. So that's one that sometimes gets forgotten Mm -hmm. uh, in the older population, but is still very important. Mm -hmm. And and would you say that that's one of those vaccinations that if you are going to be caring for your grandchildren, if you haven't been vaccinated, would that be something that you would need to do? Absolutely. And in fact, uh, something to think about uh, when you are caring for Uh, children, or uh, I know there are some older adults who may work in daycares or other things or Mm -hmm. volunteer. So if you're going to be around young children, it's something you should let your doctor know about so they can get you on that vaccination schedule. Now, you just mentioned that anyone that's going to be have access to children, are teachers required to have these vaccinations? So uh, actually, teachers are expected, just like any occupation, Mm -hmm. um, to have vaccines. Obviously, how that's handled by the school district, uh, that might vary uh, depending on where they work. Uh, But I can tell you as a physician, I have expectations about how I should be vaccinated because what I come in contact with. Mm -hmm. And depending on your occupation, this is why it's very important to let your physician know the type of work you're doing, who you're interacting with, because that might make you... Uh, more eligible for certain types of vaccines that might be different from the regular um, community person in your age group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the one thing that we can definitely um, highlight is the importance of thinking communal, you know, and thinking beyond your yourself, you know, beyond your children, thinking about, you know, beyond your, 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 yourself as an individual, because as you mentioned, and something that I think we reiterated um, numerous times throughout this conversation is that if you're not vaccinated, that you can, uh, you are, ex- you're basically exposing uh, other people to this particular disease. That's correct. Absolutely, and this is a way that you can protect yourself and protect those around you. I tell some of my patients sometimes, hey, if I know no one likes to get a shot, I know I don't either. Uh, but think about all the people that you could be protecting uh, by not being a transmission agent for some of these diseases in the community. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, when people think of it that way, they look at immunizations a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Well, you think about the science of immunizations and the vaccine. Um, I think that the thing that's really important, and I would like you to kind of expand on this, is that vaccinations are something that uh, has been around for many, many years, and it seems to be something that's constantly being approved upon. Mm-hmm. And change and adapt it to based on what occurs within the community. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So um, there is a whole science around immunizations and uh, viruses and bacteria that go through the community. And these are constantly being looked at by organizations like the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are people who spend their life's work every day thinking about viruses that have already been in our community for many, many years and how our vaccines can be more effective. And also, can we develop vaccines to things that have not yet been protected against? Uh, So I know it seems like there are many more vaccines that are available to people now than maybe there were even 10 years ago. Oh, definitely, yeah. But just think about all of those diseases that we could prevent from hitting the community. And I'll, I'll, again, two quick historical footnotes. I mean, no one ever gets polio. I mean, polio is something that when my mother was a child, um, every parent, my grandparents would worry about. Um, and polio has basically been wiped out. Mm-hmm. Smallpox, um, a terrible disease, uh, a, a killer disease, um, has virtually been eliminated from the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it has uh, popped up here and there uh, in certain parts of the world when vaccines go down. But we have been able to wipe out certain diseases from the planet because of vaccines. Um, and we hope to do that in the future with some of the ones that we've talked about today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that I, I highlighted in my notes, and I and I think it's a perfect time to say it, you said the whole the whole reason for getting vaccinations is that, in, and this is some quote, you said an illness that you will never know. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's what's so important is that I vaccinations are protecting you from diseases that you hope to never get. Correct? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I know that that can sometimes be hard for patients in our community to think about when they're getting immunized because um, we're, we're trying to protect them against something that they may not have ever experienced or may never experience. Right. Um, I mean, we're going to have a whole generation of kids that actually won't know what chicken pox is. Right. But um, that's a good thing. But that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, that was sort of a rite of passage when I was a kid to get chicken pox and everyone knew when they got it and what they were doing. And now that's something that 
will probably be largely eliminated or greatly reduced over time. Uh, and that can sometimes be a hard thing for people to think about. We spend so much time and energy making sure that our hospitals can treat certain diseases. It's way better to go upstream and prevent that disease from ever occurring. Mm-hmm. Now, we're getting down to the uh, almost to the end of the segment. I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of just talk about some of the important things that HAP is doing um, in the community in regards to vaccinations. Absolutely. So Health Alliance Plan is really, uh, for for many of your listeners, has been around for many years and is greatly committed to the health of people in southeastern Michigan and also in the uh, the lower peninsula up in Flint in that area. We have a variety of programs that you outlined earlier that I oversee. Mm -hmm. uh, And our whole company is really committed to the promotion of wellness and health. Uh, We obviously uh, work with a lot of our local physicians and hospitals um, to promote immunizations. We work intensely with the Henry Ford Health System, uh, with other large health systems in the area to make sure that we do whatever we can to promote uh, vaccinations and proper immunizations. If you are a HAP member uh, and you show your card, you should be able to get a vaccine wherever it is offered. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is really our goal, is to try to reduce or eliminate any barrier to proper vaccination as much as possible. We just got done having a big uh, immunization fair up in Flint, actually, uh, last Saturday, uh, where we were trying, again, to educate parents and children about the importance of vaccination and immunization. Um, And that is a community that's been hard hit by a lot of diseases because of lead and other things, which makes them more susceptible to some of these diseases that we're vaccinating against. Uh, So whatever that we can do to educate, we're doing that through our website, through our printed uh, publications, uh, again, through work with our system, health systems in the area uh, to promote and educate uh, our community about the importance of vaccination. Now, I just, uh, can you go back a little bit? You mentioned that because of the incidents with the water that, that people in Flint are at higher risk. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Right. So exposure to certain toxins in the community Mm -hmm. um, can reduce people's ability to fight off certain infections. And so we have intensified our work in the Flint area. We have a very large um, focus on the Medicaid population in Flint, uh, as well as our Medicare population. And both the young and old in that community are at greater risk for some types of bacterial diseases. Um, and so whatever we can do to help make sure that they're vaccinated properly is important. Um, air contaminants in the air make people more susceptible to respiratory, respiratory illness, lung diseases. Okay. So that's why flu vaccines, pneumonia vaccines are also very important, uh, both in southeast Michigan and up in Flint. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for expanding on that. And I'm happy to hear that HAP is really taking steps to um, educate the community as well as, you know, decrease the barriers to immunizations. Because as we've highlighted throughout this conversation, it's, uh, it can be the difference between life or death. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, I wanted to give you the opportunity to just uh, mention anything that, again, that I have not brought up that you think is really important. Is there anything that I did not ask you that you think... <laughs> Uh, my listeners would benefit from hearing. Well, first, I want to thank you again for having us here. I think it's it's a great opportunity to talk about this. This is really something where there should be no debate. Mm-hmm. Um, really, the most important thing is for people in the community to understand the importance of getting vaccinated, both for themselves and for the protection of others in the community, whether you're young whether you're old or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a number of diseases now that we can prevent or at least reduce the risk uh, of the impact of those diseases if they do get immunized. So please, um, please watch your TV, get on the internet, learn about vaccines. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can check out the HAP website, the CDC website, the state of Michigan website. If you have questions, ask your doctor about vaccines. There's, you can get your vaccines anywhere. One of the things I'd like to mention is If you don't have the means to get a vaccine, your community health department uh, for your county has most of these vaccines available. Okay. Uh, That's a very important resource for young children and for seniors. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so um, that is another place that if you're in between insurance or you're not able to get vaccinated because you don't have the means, you can always contact your county health department and find out how you can get vaccinated. Now, are there any specific health conditions or other factors in which someone should not get certain vaccines or should wait before getting them? Great. Yes, we did not cover that. So uh, a couple of high-risk groups where you should consult with your physician before getting vaccinated. So folks that are on chemotherapy, 
folks who have uh, severe uh, immune conditions like HIV and others, Mm -hmm. they may be susceptible to some side effects of these vaccines. Uh, They may still get vaccinated, but they should get vaccinated under the supervision of a physician to make sure that the timing of that vaccine is appropriate. The other thing is that people with certain immune conditions sometimes don't mount an appropriate immune response to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So you want to get them through some element of treatment for their underlying disease before they actually get the vaccine so that it's not it's not ineffective on them. Okay. Okay. Now, one thing that I just this popped up in my mind that I did want you to talk about. And so we're going to kind of go back a little bit in reference to the flu vaccine. I believe you said that it was really important that people get the flu vaccine at a certain time yes. of the year mm-hmm. because it doesn't actually become um can you explain right yeah. <laughs> so you know where uh, I'm going there. absolutely <laughs> so um officially um we like to try to get the maximum number of people vaccinated by about december 1st okay, yeah. of a of a given flu season because it takes somewhere between 4 and 8 weeks uh for it can be as as early as 2 weeks but we we try to allow up to six to eight weeks for full immunity That's after the vaccine. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so peak flu typically will be somewhere between January and mid-February, which means really you want to be vaccinated by the beginning of December to have your full immunity before peak flu season. We will start seeing flu cases as early as October this year. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, it, obviously, we know not everyone's going to get vaccinated right on Labor Day mm-hmm. uh, or shortly thereafter. Uh, but the peak flu really won't occur until January. But we do want people to focus on getting their vaccine sometime shortly after Labor Day and try to get it in before December. However, even if December come, comes and goes, I always say it's never too late to get a flu vaccine. Mm-hmm. So we are still actively vaccinating folks even into February, March, even April. Um, because there can still be active flu cases all the way through the beginning of May. Uh, So ideally, between September and December is really when you want to get your flu vaccine to get your maximum protection, Mm -hmm. but it's never too late to get it whenever you do get it. Okay. Now, one of the things that I've seen also is that you can get the flu vaccine at various places. So I know for your vaccinations, you know, specifically for your children, you'd probably have to go to the physician, but it seems like the flu vaccine is something that's even available at like CVS Pharmacy, I want to say. Absolutely. So all of the retail outlets um, have the flu vaccine. The retail, uh, like CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, et cetera, they may not carry every vaccine, but mm-hmm. they will often carry the flu vaccine. It's typically typically going to be administered at the pharmacy mm-hmm. uh, at that place. And part of this is a community effort to make it very convenient for people to get their flu vaccine. If you're a young adult in your 30s, you're probably not going to the doctor otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a way for you to get the vaccine without having to see your physician uh, if you're otherwise in good health. So there are a variety of places, and most of these places actually will, on their website, actually say where they can get flu. On our HAP website, actually, on our flu uh, website, we actually have a list of retail outlets that will administer flu vaccine in their pharmacies. Okay. And they, you can actually, actually put in your address, and it'll tell you how far it is from where you live. Oh, that's awesome. So really no excuse. <laughs> that's right. No excuse at all. Do you know what typical cost is for the flu vaccine? So flu vaccine uh, can vary. Uh, Typically, it should be no more than about $25 if you're, I mean, if you are fully uninsured and you had to pay out of pocket for it, Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not going to run any more than $15 to $25. If you're insured with a company like HAP, and I think most of the health plans are the same as HAP are, if you show your card, you really should not get charged for that. Uh, if you go to your county health department, as I mentioned earlier, you will not get charged for it by the county health department. Okay, okay. And now what was the website again for if you said uh, if you go on the HAP website? So if you go to HAP.org backslash flu, mm-hmm. uh, you will get to our flu website. And we're constantly updating that flu site uh, to make sure that we have all the information there for anyone that can look at it. That's a public site, by the way. You don't have to be a HAP member to go to that site. Um, The other site I would encourage you to think about, too, is the Mm cdc.gov website, which is cdc.gov backslash flu Mm -hmm. as well. And we reference that site on our website as well. Now, Dr. Watson, why is it that vaccinations are so important to you? Because you you have an extensive background, but this is a particular topic that's very important to you. Well, it's important to me. I'm, uh, I'm still a practicing hospitalist. I take care of patients that are admitted to the hospital, and I took care of far too many flu patients uh, this past winter. 
Uh, a lot of these folks, um, some of them were vaccinated, but a lot of them were not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so personally, when I see folks that are coming into the hospital for something that could have been either fully prevented or at least would not have been as severe as they have been vaccinated, um, I certainly feel a, a personal conviction to try to get the word out about vaccines. As I said earlier, I'm a parent and I think of other kids in the community and we should do our best to protect them. We we spend lots of time on seatbelts and bike helmets and other things to protect them. Mm-hmm. I would put vaccines as high or as higher on the list as those things as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I think it's so important for people to take whatever actions they can to protect themselves. And it's all about prevention to me. Absolutely. You know, I think it's much waste, worse and uh, definitely more expensive to try to treat something and and definitely uh, cheaper, <laughs> more cost effective. A, a shot in the yeah. arm hurts a lot less <laughs> than four days in the hospital. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, not to mention the cost and the time that's lost. And unfortunately, as we did, you did highlight. And unfortunately, in some situations, um, it's not something that's treated because the person passed away. That's true, yeah. and and that's the most that's the most devastating thought about some of these disorders. There are some things in medicine that we still can't cure, but there are many things that if we can prevent, that is really the best cure that we have. Mm -hmm. And although I think there's this misconception, particularly with flu again, where we do have some treatments with flu, uh, we have Tamiflu that can be given uh, in the hospital. uh, But in the the instance, for instance, of these pediatric deaths, over 60% of those deaths that occurred in those unvaccinated children, they still occurred while they were still in the hospital. So although they had treatment, you know, so we really have to focus on vaccines. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Watson, for coming on the show today. I uh, appreciate your time and your efforts and your continued work in your community. This is Angela Moore of Empowered and Nine to Dance Superstation, the future of radio. the sculptor. Oh, she don't see the light that's shining. Deep within the eyes can find it. Maybe we have made a blind so It's time to round up hunger with Kroger. Here's Rachel to tell us more. The easiest way for you to support is through our Kroger Roundup program. When you check out, you have the option to round up your total to the nearest dollar. While the amount may seem small, the impact is huge in our goal to end hunger. Whatever you need, it's right here on 910 AM Superstation. Miss Johnson is on the line. Good evening to you. Every- time you turn around, they doing something with Detroit Public Schools. I am so tired of them messing with Detroit Public Schools, I don't know what to do. You know, Detroit Public School was fine until they stole the money. Yes. That's the biggest <laughs> thing. Yeah. People need to realize they stole the money. Ain't nobody miss you stole. Even when you bought the financial manager in, yes. you stole more money than what the yeah. money that, that we had. Missing. Oh, there was a lot know, going on that didn't seem to, I don't think we're ever going to find out what that's, happened That's right. To the that's because they did not want an audit. You're absolutely right, Ms. Johnson. They stole the money. It was the biggest cover-up and corruption in the history of America, what they did to our schools. They always followed the money. 910 AM Superstation. We are the future of radio. 910 AM Superstation is in a league of its own. We are the only talk radio station in the metro Detroit area sensitive to the African-American community. Make sure you join us on what station? 910 AM, the Superstation. 910 AM. 910 AM. On 910 AM, Superstation. 910 AM, Superstation. Metro Detroit's only African-American-based talk radio station. Stay up to date with current events and breaking news on our Facebook page. Search and like 910 AM Superstation on Facebook and you'll see everything new, everything exciting, and all things Detroit. 910 AM Superstation News on Facebook Live right now. Danny Cleary Hockey Camp for ages 7 to 11, Monday through Friday, August 20th through 24th at Wallace Ice Arena, 550 Long Pine Road, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Camp fee includes 10 hours of instructional ice time, 4 hours off ice time, 4 hours professional classroom presentation, last day game, DCHS hockey jersey, socks, t-shirt, shorts, 2 rolls of tape, 1 water bottle, and 8 by 10 signed Danny Cleary picture and banquet at the Danny Cleary Hockey Camp. We're the hottest station in town. Whatever you need, it's right here on 910 AM Superstation. The most powerful voices in the urban community. Three, two, one. 
You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. The future of radio. You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. The best in the city. The future of radio. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit. 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Would you and your loved ones recognize the 10 signs of stroke? Anybody's at risk for stroke, and it can happen to anyone anytime. I didn't think this could happen to me. I was only 39. If you suspect stroke, call 911 immediately. The day I suffered a stroke, my wife recognized the signs and took action. The day I suffered a stroke, my husband didn't wait for my symptoms to disappear. Can you recognize the 10 signs of stroke? Is that a faucet running? That's not a faucet. That's a river rushing through the forest. Forest rivers provide over 100 million people with clean water to drink. What? I can't hear you because of the vacuum. That's not a vacuum. That's the trees in the forest cleaning up the air we breathe. I didn't know the trees were so amazing. Yep, and the forest gives us shade, trees to climb. That's awesome. Let's go explore some more. Visit the forest today and enjoy all it does just for you. To learn more about the forest and find one near you, go to discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. You must have thrown a thousand pitches teaching him to hit a home run. Spent countless Saturdays running routes so he could learn to hit an open receiver. Endless afternoons teaching him how to hit the three-pointer. But how much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? Teaching boys that all violence against women is wrong is one of the most important things a man can do. Learn how to start the conversation at teachearly.org. Brought to you by Futures Without Violence and the Ad Council. You're struggling with your mortgage. You think about it all the time. What are we going to do if we lose the house? It's time to stop thinking and start dialing. Call 1-888-995-HOPE for a free government program that offers expert one-on-one advice about your mortgage options. We've helped over a million homeowners, and we want to help you. Call 1-888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. I heard on the news about that five-year-old who found his uncle's gun. The kid didn't know it was loaded. I heard on the news about that 14-year-old girl who was bullied online for like a year. She couldn't take it anymore, so she got her dad's gun from his nightstand. I heard on the news about that guy who broke into someone's house, stole a gun from the hall closet. He accidentally shot his cousin in the head. She killed herself. And later killed the owner of the store he was trying to rob. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Okay, so, Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's? Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, and my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it! Seriously? Why? Because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What, what? No! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. When I grow up, I want to be a glass countertop in a new home. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's best birthday present. When I grow up, I want to be a football stadium. When I grow up, I want to be a warm place on a cold day. When I grow up, I want to be a fancy when back I grow up, I want to be a bike that races around the when country. When I grow up, I want to be a bench on a forest trail. When I grow trail. up, 
I want to be a rocking chair on when a sunny up, porch. I want to be a skyscraper. I want to be a... 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 When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. A public service advertisement brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. Okay, so Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's? Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, and my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it! Seriously? Why? Because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What, what? No! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. She just wants to be beautiful. She goes unnoticed. She knows no limits. She craves attention. She praises an image she prays to be sculpted by the Welcome sculptor. back. This is the Angela Morgan Powered oh, on 9 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. Please tune in every Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. Call 313-778-7600 if you want to join in on conversation today. I hope you enjoyed my previous conversation with Dr. Peter Watson about vaccinations. I hope it inspires you to take action in your own life. 9 to the AM Superstation will broadcast live from Hunter's House Hamburgers at 3575 Whitworth. I'm sorry, 35,075 Woodward in Birmingham, Wednesday through Dream Cruise, Saturday, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. daily. Come out and join 9 to the AM Superstation at Hunter House Hamburgers on Woodward in Birmingham as we ramp up for the Dream Cruise 7 to 2 starting Wednesday through Saturday daily. My next guest, Cassie Silverton, has worked in the health and well-being field for over a decade. <clears throat> excuse me, melding her unique background in operations management with her passion for well-being. She has served as director for higher learning at a large medical system, benefit broker, health plan, and corporate wellness vendor. Cassie has authored our number one best-selling book, Back to Balance, and speaks internationally on the topic of personal well-being in addition to corporate employee well-being. She participated in extensive training programs such as the University of Michigan Leadership and Operations Program in the Detroit Medical Center Leadership Academy. She has received degrees or certificates in the following disciplines. Health coach from the Institute of Integrate Nutrition, registered yoga teacher from Yoga Alliance, laughter yoga instructor. I always love when I see uh-huh. that. I love that. <laughs> um, NLP practitioner, the American Heart Association's basic life support and trainer program, and raw food teacher, nutritionist, and chef. Cassie lives a spiritual, balanced life filled with friends, family, exercise, biking, practicing Eastern philosophies, and daily gratitude. Well, welcome back to the show, Cassie. Thank you. And, and we should say sometimes <laughs> on the end there, because I try. I do try, but it doesn't always work out to keep that balance. Yes, as I t- just told you a minute ago, I'm trying to find it myself. <laughs> yes, we all are. So according to Dr. Frank Lippman, um, many of us have done a, you know, have taken steps to do a detox to eliminate internal toxins from our body. But many do not think of doing anything about the toxins in our homes. Yeah. Uh, why is it so important to consider the toxins in our homes? Well, we're there a lot, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, our work, our home, those are the two places we spend the majority of our time. And quite often, you know, we, we keep our homes closed. So quite often, you know, the summers get hot. We keep the air conditionings on. Our winters here, specifically in Michigan, get very cold. We mm-hmm. keep our heat on. We keep those doors, windows closed, so we don't get a whole lot of opportunity to air it out. So mm-hmm. that's first and foremost something that we could do to really help remove any type of toxins, air out the space. Um, and many of us just don't do that. But thinking about the days where it gets pretty moderate, you know, the mild temperatures, opening things up and allowing that would be a huge benefit. Um, but, you know, there are so many things from mattresses to dry cleaners mm-hmm. to the, you know, um, let's say the cleaners that we use in any part of our home, you know, the... Um, Cleaners that we use in our washing machine, the cleaners that we use on our skin, any any of these type of toxins um, get trapped in our house. And unless we're using super green, 
eco-friendly types of cleaners, um, there are those there. And quite often on the market, what they will do is they will say things are safe. Mm -hmm. And there haven't been a whole lot of studies around them. And then we find out years later they're not. Mm -hmm. And so quite often you'll hear someone with a rebuttal of saying, you know, I heard it's safe. I heard it's fine. There's been studies. And, you know, my thing is I don't want to be the lab rat. You know, I mean, if we don't know, we haven't used these chemicals for, you know, right. decades and generations and, you know, multiple people have been studied on this and we truly don't know. And until we do, I don't want to be the person that's, you know, basically the lab rat, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want these tests to be done on me. So I Seriously. tend Yeah. Yeah. And I tend to be someone who just is very clean and careful about it. And I want to use all natural cleaners um, if I have the time I will make my own but quite often and they are becoming more and more popular to be able to find them in the stores um, and less expensive which Mm -hmm. is the key too because they were at one point very expensive Mm mm-hmm now, the average home is thought to contain approximately 500 to 1,000 chemicals. It's crazy. Many of which we are unable to see, smell, or taste. It is argued that while these chemicals may be tolerated individually and in small doses, problems can arise when one is exposed to them in combination sure. or in larger doses. How can we start to reduce the toxin exposure in our homes? Yeah, I think switching just slowly. And, and when I say, you know, start getting a little bit more clean in your products, I'm not saying go home, throw out everything you own, and spend hundreds of dollars to bring in more, you know, cleaner products. What I'm saying is maybe the next time, and I don't want to use certain brand names, but, you know, your, your traditional cleaners expire, you can look for a healthier option, you know, mm-hmm. a cleaner option, an eco-friendly. You know, when you flip over the back of these cleaners and you read the ingredients mm-hmm. list, do you know what the ingredients are? Yeah. Because if not, it's probably a chemical. Right. And that's where we want to start thinking and looking at. And, you know, we're very lucky in that we've learned how to harness the power of plants, antibacterial, antimicrobial. You know, I mean, we Mm -hmm. can actually use these features and these um, potent properties from plants to be able to use as cleaning products in our home. And that's how eco-friendly products are made. And so, you know, you'll see things like rose hip such and such and, Mm -hmm. you know, like lavender. And those are the types of things that I want to use to clean my home because they're very effective and they're also safe and very natural. Mm -hmm. And if you have children, if you have pets, you know, you think about the floors and your pets are laying on them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, things like this. They And kids, kids lay on the floor. They play with toys on the floor. They do. They pick up things and put them in their mouth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're being exposed to anything you're cleaning the floor with. And we quite often think like, oh, well, if, if it's on the shelf, if the government approved it, then it's safe for us. Mm, no, it's far from the truth. Right. It's a big misconception. And it's unfortunate. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to travel a lot. I know you have as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I go over to Europe, when I go to different countries, um, they don't have the same rates of diseases, but they also are not allowed to put the same types of things in their cleaning products and in their foods that we mm-hmm. are here. They have governmently mandated, you know, they have said this is not allowed. They don't allow die in their food the same way we do here. Mm -hmm. They don't allow different types of chemicals and toxins in their cleaners and their food, and they just don't have the same issues we do. So I look at that and think, like, you know, there's a lot of things going on. They, of course, have a different lifestyle, and, you know, everything's different over there. But there is no doubt there's a correlation between that. Mm -hmm. And for me, it just makes sense to pay a little bit more money to have the eco-friendly products. And I think I'm saving that money on the back end by not paying it through disease. Yeah, most definitely you are. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, you don't want to be the lab rat. No, not at all. I feel the same way about genetically modified foods or, Mm -hmm. you know, different different things that are out there. And and there are great things about that as well. Totally different topic. But, um, you know, genetically modified foods allow us to get food to different parts of the world that otherwise can't grow food. And that's a wonderful thing. But we don't know long term what that does to us. So Mm -hmm. I've decided not to eat them. And Mm -hmm. there's just a lot of a lot of things going on in our society. And unfortunately, industry is out to make money. They are, you know, and And at our expense, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And quite often that means cutting corners, using cheaper products or cheaper ingredients, you know, Mm -hmm. to make cheaper products or yield a higher um, margin on their products. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, that means we could get sick from it. Yeah. And speaking of sick, according to the American Lung Association, many cleaning supplies or household products can irritate the eyes or throat, can cause headaches and other health problems, including cancer. Some products release dangerous chemicals, including volatile organic compounds, otherwise known as VOCs which can contribute to chronic respiratory problems, allergic reactions, and even more headaches. What are some natural alternatives to chemical cleaners? Well, it depends on what exactly you're trying to clean. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when we're looking at the different types of, you know, household cleaners, there's, you know, some great things that we can actually dilute and make on our own. But, you know, if you look at vinegar, 
Mm-hmm. That is one of the most natural cleaning products we could come across, but it has a little bit of a smell. It does. I use it all the time. Uh-huh. But yeah, that can, <laughs> my husband hates it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it does. It kind of stinks. But what I do is I make my own, and what I do is I toss into it some essential oils. So I mm-hmm. really love essential oils, and they are extremely potent. Yeah. A couple drops goes a really long way with that. It goes a really that. long way. Yeah. yeah. And you can also use um, Castile soap. Mm-hmm. And so that's like the Dr. Bronner's. There's other mm-hmm. name you know name brands of that, but those are very pure, very very effective, you know, mm-hmm. a, a little tiny capful will go for an entire house. And it's, it's not very expensive. You get no. a pretty big bottle for not very much. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think when it's diluted, especially, I mean, you can do your whole house, your counters, your floors, your walls, your bathrooms, you know, you can put it on your body. That's mm-hmm. what I use actually right on my body mm-hmm. as well. And so, you know, knowing that there are really clean quality products out there, you know, um, vinegar is great because it has this natural acid and antibacterial elements to eliminate and disinfect. And then you, of course, can put the different types of essential oils in that. But baking soda is really good if you want to make a scrub. Mm -hmm. So like it lifts stains, it brightens, it deodorizes, and you can even combine that if you want with vinegar, with the different essential oils, with water, and you make a paste out of it. And it's like a scrub, almost like um, I'm trying to think of one of the scrubs, that soft scrub. Right, yeah. right, yeah, soft scrub. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so very good for cleaning, like, the bathtub yep. or sink. Exactly. Like that. Mm-hmm. Yep, anything where there's grout and you need to actually scrub through it. Um, peppermint w- is wonderful. It has antibacterial and insect-repellent qualities, which is great, and another really nice thing to learn about. You can put on your skin when you're outside. Oh, and you don't want to have that. those bugs attracted to you. Okay. Yep. Well, which... you know, I got to tell you, Kat, something that's really funny. So my sure. husband and I will go to the park, and the bugs eat them alive. <laughs> and you and, don't? And, and I never have. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I've always wondered, like, what is it about me that, the, you know, the bugs don't like me? I always tell you, my husband, because you're so sweet, and maybe I'm not as sweet <laughs> I doubt that. I have heard that quite often, too, though. But, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's a blood type or if it's, you know, the actual scent coming off your skin. Right. I, we should research that because that is very interesting because I do know some people just get attacked right. by them. And other yeah. people come out of it, you know, unscathed. Yeah. Like nothing is there. But maybe your husband should start using peppermint, peppermint you know, behind okay. his ears or on his arms so you would or whatever. apply it directly, like, on yeah, your Yeah, you skin. can apply it on your skin. Um, there are different types of um, uh, oils that can't be put on your skin, and some of them need carrier oils. And all a carrier oil is is, like, a coconut or olive oil or whatever, and it dilutes it a little bit because mm-hmm. some of them can be so strong that it could actually sting you. Peppermint's not so bad. Okay. Yeah, but okay. you still could put it in a carrier oil and put it on your skin or in a carrier lotion just like cocoa butter or whatever, and put it on your skin that way, too. Somebody not familiar with that, can you kind of explain that? Somebody hearing that may not understand. Meaning essential mean, oils? The carrier oils. Yes. Like, yeah. yeah, so essential oils are basically, what they do is they take lavender or rose or peppermint or whatever it is, and they um, they dilute it or they um, take out the oil. And the oils can have a very strong property. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very effective, especially for what we're talking about here. They can be used as different types of medicine. Um, they come in these tiny, tiny little bottles. They're like... Like, I forget how many, how many milliliters, but maybe mm-hmm. like a third of an ounce. They're very, very small and sometimes very expensive. If you put those directly on your skin, they could sometimes burn you. Mm-hmm. And so there's something called a carrier oil, which basically means you're diluting it a little bit with larger oil that's very safe to put on your skin. So that could be a coconut oil, an olive oil, a sesame oil, whatever, you mm-hmm. know, whatever type of oil it is. And what you do is you put maybe... Um, let's say two tablespoons of the carrier oil Mm -hmm. with like three or four drops of the essential oil and you mix that up and then it's safer to put on the skin okay so that you don't actually put it directly on a lot of people actually use essential oils where they'll put it on their bottom of the feet that's a very effective way to get it into your system Mm -hmm. um so that that's where typically sometimes they'll use carrier oils okay i'm getting getting tongue twisted here carrier oils carrier oils (laughs) (laughs) it's a hard one to say you know that's something i've never done i've never put the essential oils on my feet really I've never done that. Yeah, it's effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, specifically some of the antibacterial and um, On Guard, which uh, doTERRA makes. I'm sure there's equivalent ones out there for living. Um, what's the other one? The living uh, essential livings or so something. Yes, you know, there's I've a few big that. ones out there, yeah. but I'm sure they have something similar to it. But that's the one that kind of fights the flu and cold and those types of things. So I've used it quite a bit on the bottom of my feet. Now, what about diffusers? Yeah, they're great. I mean, they basically clean the air. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we're talking about, too, is that healthy home. And so using a diffuser, what happens is you put a little bit of the oil inside of there, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with water, and sometimes it actually just burns that, and it it releases into the air, um, you know, moist, like uh, almost like a... uh, a, a, not a dehydrator, a hydrator, you know, mm-hmm. a, um, when you're putting water into the air. Right. Yeah, and so it's similar, but it's it's releasing the essential oil with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're really, really healthy. 
Yeah, no, we have one in my bedroom, and, and my my son had actually bought me a new one, and then my other son nice. took it. <laughs> so he's been using it. Oh yeah. I, since I received it. And they have some really pretty ones now. I saw one recently over on the west side of the state um, where it was just so gorgeous. It looked like, I mean, like a home decoration piece, Mm -hmm. you know, and then you could have them in multiple rooms at your home. And I mean, I've had them for so many years and it's, 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 it's there, right? You know what it. You know what it's doing. It doesn't look like it's part of the decoration. It kind right. of stands out it's at you. Like, okay, look at that plastic thing. <laughs> right. Thing That's there. right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and now that they're start, now it's becoming so popular. Yeah. You know, some of these companies have invested money in making them look prettier, mm-hmm. and so it's a nice way to do that and not kind of be like, hey, look, I'm putting medicine in my air right now. Yeah. yeah. Now speaking of diffusers, I know a lot of people love the scent of those. You mm-hmm. know, um, can you speak about air fresheners? Yeah, I'd love to. So air fresheners have a lot of toxins in them, Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure that all of them do. There's going to be some natural ones that are made from essential oils that do not. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually was I found online um, a car air freshener that um, basically it was like a round. It's like a felt piece, and what you do is you open it up and you put the essential oils on it, and then it diffuses that way. It was really quite cool. And so you're still able to use that. But some of the others are just toxic, as you can imagine. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you think about they're they're trying to make it smell so good and, you know, with a small amount of material mm-hmm. in there. So they're packing a lot of toxins in it. Yeah. I know when I go into a home where there is that or I get into a car with an air freshener, it just smells so toxic to me. But that's because I've lived so clean for so long. Exactly. You know, a lot yeah. of people wouldn't pick up on that they think it smelled really good Mm -hmm. so it's something we need to be careful about or maybe read the ingredient packet just like we would with the cleaners right right well because once you plug that little sucker into the uh, it's quick (laughs) isn't it it's just you know it's going all over your house yes yeah, and you're breathing that in, so right. it's really important that you well, know what you're breathing in. Well, and people with asthma and people with allergies, you know, the, I mean, this is a big deal, as, long, as well as mattresses that mm-hmm. have all these chemicals in it. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, your face is, like, planted in this yeah. for at least eight hours a day, sometimes more, hopefully not less. Yeah, but, you yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. And, and then people are complaining and, and really trying to struggling with lung problems mm-hmm. and you know and not just even knowing why and it's a thing right. you're sleeping on we actually have a, um, a company local to um, Detroit and they're called reverie and mm-hmm. they make a completely clean toxic free mattress Wow. yeah yeah they're really great as a matter of fact I'm in the process of moving homes which I have told you about yeah. and uh, I think I might buy one of their mattresses they are more expensive but there's a lot of really great things about them, and they don't have all those toxic chemicals in them. And that's just huge to me. Yeah. See, that's so frustrating to me because, yeah. it's, I, you know, the more and more research that I do, and that's what I love about this show is because I meet so many wonderful people like yourself that educate me about, you know, so many different things. And I think the more you know, the better you can be, sure. you know. And, but it, it is really frustrating because it seems like every week I learn of more things that are out there that are harmful right. to you. Yeah. and. Um, and it's it's, be, it's 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 hard enough to try to eat well and take care of yourself and try to be mindful of the things that you you know take into your body, the things you put on your body, which we'll talk about later. Sure. But to think that it's o- it's allowed that it's okay for companies to make mattresses right. and to put you know yep. uh, materials in there that's harmful to you and that's okay and it's acceptable in right. this country. It just it doesn't make sense to me. It seems stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's all driven by money, right? Yeah. I mean, they're filling it with the cheapest ingredients they can that are most effective for what they're trying to do, which is extend the life of the mattress and not let it break down. Um, you know, it's it is. It's not only the mattresses, but the you know everything, everything, the food, the water. Mm-hmm. I mean, gosh, you know, I, I get angry as well, and I get more angry, I think, at our government than anyone. Yeah, and it really frustrates me. I'm like, how are you not taking this seriously? How how is it more important for these lobbyists to be able to run this situation than for the voice of the people to be able to run it? And you know, I, I think we are seeing a shift. Thank mm-hmm. God. You know, mm-hmm. people are getting more and more interested in their health and wanting to be green and wanting to eat clean and these types of things. And I think what happened in Flint was a really great example right. of our water supply. And you know, a, a lot has been. Um, put in the light about this, thank God. But I, I think that's when change starts to happen, mm-hmm. and we're finally there. But it is very frustrating and angering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, especially when you take so many steps, when you intentionally take steps to be healthy. Sure. You know, and you're trying to, you're spending the extra money for, you know, cleaner products, or you're taking time to make your right. own. Yes. And you're trying to eat well and exercise, and then you lay down on a mattress that is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, like, who would think? Yeah. You know, I mean, who has that in their mind? Right. You don't even think your mattress could be harming your health. Yeah. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to stay on top of all of it. It really is. It is. And all you can do is really, you know, small changes one at a time mm-hmm. as you learn about them, as you hear them. I mean, all of us, I mean, I, 
I, just like you, I'm so lucky to be in this field, right. and I'm constantly learning new things. You mm-hmm. know, and everything I learn is like, okay, well, next time I buy a mattress, right. I don't I don't run out and dump my mattress and right. get a brand new one, but right. I'm like, next time, that's next in time. my head, you yeah. know. And those are the kind of things we can slowly make change in our life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know how we got on the mattresses, but I'm glad that we it's did. Clean homes, <laughs> clean homes. Yes. yes. <laughs> but I do want to kind of go back to the um, you know chemical clean clean. Cleaners. Yes. Cleaners. So <laughs> Cleaners. some more yeah. some more options for the yeah. essential oils. Yes. And the, yeah. yeah. So we have um, lemon juice. It's okay. really good for killing mildew, mold, and eliminating odor. Okay. Of course. And we know that because it's in a lot of our cleaners. You know, if you think about the things that you see being touted in our cleaners. So like Lysol will have with lemon. And it has the yellow package, you know. So like in our heads, she that should tell us. Okay. We'll continue our conversation after this right. break. This is Ansel Morv Empowered on 9 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. No limits, she craves attention, she praises an image, she prays. Who's the future of radio? We are. Who has the hot takes and best calls? We do. And where do you go to get the breaking news and expert opinion? Would they look at the latest news headline at the top of the hour? None other than 910 AM Superstation. We've got you covered from sunup to sundown during the week with Greg Davis. Hey, this is Bishop Greg Davis. Carrie Jackson. Nolan Finley, Jack Lessonberry, Bankale Thompson, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Do you know what time it is? It's Al Sharpton's time. And Sam Riddle. And don't forget to listen to Henry Payne, Elena Herrera, and Angela Moore. Hello, this is Angela Moore. Please join me on Empowered every Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. It's the greatest collection of minds on the radio, and they can only be found in one place. None other than 910 AM Superstation, the future of radio. Every business is constantly looking for new customers and ways to increase their bottom line in order to stay successful and thrive. Without new customers, your business will only decline. Let the power of AM 910 Superstation showcase your store, your company, and your product. Now that's effective advertising. AM 910 Superstation call 586-790-3838. That's 586-790-3838. 910 AM Superstation is the voice of the people. Don't believe me? Just listen. 910 AM has something that no other station has. A platform for everyone to have a voice. Black, white, young, old. It's a place for people to be themselves. I love 910 AM. So many articulate and thoughtful, diverse voices and wonderful stories. So when you think of 910 AM Superstation, we want you to tune in, call in, and don't forget to find us on social media. She just wants to be beautiful, she goes unnoticed, she knows, no limits, she craves. Welcome back, welcome back. This is Angela Moore of Empowered, and now it's Sam Superstation, the future of radio. Call 313-778-7600 if you want to join in the conversation today. So prior to the break, Cassie Soberton and I were talking about um, rep- alternatives to chemical cleaners. And so you were talking about the benefits of lemon juice. right. Yes, so lemon juice kills mildew, mold, eliminates odor. It's a really great, easy, natural cleaner, Mm -hmm. which is nice that most of us have in our house. And you can also buy pure lemon juice, Mm -hmm. you know, just in the bottle, so you don't have to, like, squeeze lemons. That's what I do. Just so everyone knows. Yeah, Yeah, and it's very easy to do. I actually just just bought a new bottle recently, and they're only about $1.50. I mean, they're very inexpensive. So Um, we talked about the Castile soap, then naturally, you know, it's oil-based, of course, um, any type of essential oil provides natural, non-toxic fragrances, which we want. And the other one to highlight is um, hydrogen peroxide. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. a great replacement to bleach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a wonderful thing to be able to use and uh, keep all those chemicals out of your house, including bleach. Right, okay. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of people think, associate bleach with clean. Yeah, and they think you and know, it does yeah, clean. Yeah, it clean, but But it also leaves bleach and toxins with it. Yeah. I mean, bleach can hurt you, right? Yeah. I mean, there's labels on the back of it telling you how harmful it is. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you're cleaning with that, you just have to be careful because you do leave a residue behind, which kids could get and dogs could get and mm-hmm. you know, anyone else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I think about for years how um, I thought, like I said, associate bleach with clean. Right. Because growing up, that was something that you always did. You would, you would put bleach to make your sure. towels white. You would add bleach to water. You know, right. if you were really wanting to get something to be clean. I even thought at one point in the hospitals use bleach. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I do remember putting it in my laundry as well, you know, mm-hmm. when I was young and those types of things. And now we have, like, that Oxy, and, of course, baking soda is wonderful to boost any type of colors in your laundry. They make a lot of really great um, laundry detergents that are clean mm-hmm. out there. And, and more and more am I seeing even the regular brands. Right, um, are now turned yes. they're, they're now, yeah. Well, I'm sure they're losing so much market share. They have to be, yeah. 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 Well, that's what, I was going to say that's what they get, but anyway. Right, so. yeah. Well, and, you know, it's funny. So, like, along those lines, I... I always struggle with it, like this internal struggle where that's what they get and, you know, bad harm, bad for them. And why did they do this to us? But at the end of the day, like, I don't think people are making these decisions consciously. Right. You know, and maybe it's the same situation. Like yeah. I said, we at one time used bleach thinking. It was, sure. And I'm sure these companies, you know, they're probably using ingredients that were have always been used yep. until they're proven dangerous. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, at the end of the day, their job is to figure out how to get clothes clean. Right. Their job is right. not to figure out how Good to support point. our health. Yeah. You know, Good and point. I think then it's us to determine and then use our money to vote. Right. We, mm-hmm. we vote with our money. When we buy green products, we're voting in the industry that that's what we want. And then what happens is the big guys get on the bandwagon and yeah. say, oh, I better go green now. Because yeah. it's obvious consumers are interested in that, right. you know, and they're going to shift based on how we're voting with our dollars. Yeah, so we have power. Totally. Totally power in yes. our purchasing. That's right. So now we've had a great discussion about chemical cleaners. Do you have anything else that you want to share? No, I, I think that's it. I guess the only thing I do want to share is um, not to be intimidated about the process of making your own cleaners, if mm-hmm. that's what you want to do. Yeah. And you, it is nothing but a Google search away. Mm-hmm. You know, natural cleaning product um, recipe. Mm-hmm. And you will find more than you know right. to do with. And <laughs> yeah. they are going to be solid. And you're going to have to pick through and figure out, let's say you, you take the five, you know, the top five Google search hits. Right. And you, you make those. And then you're like, oh, I like this one, not these other four. Okay. Right. Let me go down that road, you know. And, and mm-hmm. you can change them. You can add different smells. You can do whatever. But it is very inexpensive if mm-hmm. you do it that way way less expensive than buying even the chemical traditional stuff Almost definitely. if you make it at your home. Yeah. So, the, I mean, just not to be intimidated by it because there is something intimidating at first about that. Mm-hmm. You know, and Google search it and have fun. Have fun with it. Yeah. And I would see it kind of as an empowering process. It's kind of like when you decide that you want to eat better and you start preparing healthy sure. foods for yourself. I could yes. see how, you know, once you um, find those good recipes and once you kind of get into right. the – you know, and where it becomes a routine yep. of, of making your own products, I think would be very empowering for you. I agree. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're creating a self a safe and healthy home. Yeah, and you can teach it with your kids and your grandkids and let them know why you're doing this to save money and to be healthier. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a wonderful thing to teach kids too. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So now we've been talking about, you know, chemical cleaners, and I know cleaners and the importance of being mindful of the chemicals in your home, yet there are also thousands of chemicals in our personal care products mm-hmm. uh-huh, that are thought to be yeah. skin irritants, endocrine disruptors, and right. carcinogenic. So what suggestions do you have for someone that has removed the chemical cleaners from the home or, or, or is planning to, right. but they say, you know, I want to also remove chemicals from the personal products that I use as well? Right. So same thing in that, you know, each time something is gone, you would replenish it with something a little bit healthier. Um, there's a ton of options out there, and quite often the best way to learn about them is to go to your local health food store. Okay. And it sounds kind of nuts, right? Health food store, why would they have all these types of skin products? But they do they because do. there's not a whole lot of other places to carry them. Yeah. Um, although more and more places are popping up that are, you know, also just like natural skin care product places, which is great. But, you know, there's um, some really great brands out there that are actually totally natural. Badger is one of them. Mm-hmm. My mm-hmm. Shell is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a slew of them. But, you know, one of the things when I first started doing this, and, and I'd say it's been about 15 years, um, I started just using straight organic oils on my body. Yes. And I didn't even know, like, I literally would take them out of my kitchen. <laughs> right. I did put the same them, thing. Yeah, yeah, put them in a little squeezy bottle or, you know, mm-hmm. some type of container and then use that on my skin. So what do you use specifically? Like olive oil, coconut uh-huh. oil. Me too. Those mm-hmm. are the two specifically mm-hmm. yeah, that I prefer. specifically, yeah. Yeah, and they're really, really great. Some people, um, you know, think that oils is a bit too much for their face. I put oils directly on my face. I do too. I've yeah. never had a problem. You know, I'm quite lucky in that I'm 41 years old and I, I don't have major signs or, you know, skin mm-hmm. problems, which is rare. Um, but I've never really used anything outside of the all-natural stuff in the last 15 years. But, you know, I mean, there are a ton of natural alternatives out there, including toothpaste, which are very important because, mm-hmm. you know, the, the gums are very um, – very thin and we can actually absorb a lot through that Mm -hmm. and so we can find natural toothpaste Um, my favorite is desert essence but there's a ton of different types out there Mm -hmm. you know Um, you can make your own toothpaste again natural (laughs) toothpaste recipe on google and you will find more than you know what to do with same thing with actually the the skincare 
Right. Same exact thing. There is so much out there. But, you know, I remember when I first started, like, I'd make them on the stove. I'd take um, cocoa butter, and I'd actually, like, melt it down and put mm-hmm. different oils in that. And then some, carrier, some um, what's it called, essential oils. Okay. So basically the oils in the pan were acting like the carrier oil. And then okay. I was putting the scent in. And okay. then I'd put it into a, a little jar, and that's what I would use on my body. It's like mm-hmm. body butter. Mm-hmm. And it's really effective. Mm-hmm. Um, same things with the soaps. We talked about the Castile soap. Right, which can yeah, be used on her body. Soap, yeah. yeah, I love Dr. Bronner's because it's super affordable and mm-hmm. really, really a great product. Um, but you know, there there are a lot of different options out there, and it's again just learning about them and trying them and starting them. Shampoo and conditioner is another one. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of different. Now, options. which ones do you like? The shampoo and conditioner. So shampoo and conditioners, I kind of alternate. Um, I like the DoTerra stuff. Okay. I really like Desert Essence. There's another brand that I really like that I'm drawing a blank on their name. It'll come to me before the end of the show. <laughs> but it's just not there yet. But I, I tend to kind of flip through them and just try different things. I have one in my upstairs bathroom, one in my downstairs. And, you know, that way I just use them differently. I will say they're not as, and I'm going to put it in air quotes, good mm-hmm. sometimes as the chemical-based stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, my hair might not be as smooth. I might have to use a little more product afterwards. Right. You know, I, I do notice a bit of a difference, um, but I choose to go ahead with that type of cleaning versus, you know, the others because um, I just think it's important for that reason. Mm-hmm. But, you know, some people, they have to try out different products, you know, because let's do. say there's 15 of them on the shelf. You, the first one you try might not be the right one for your hair. I mean, you and I, look at our hair. Right. Yeah. So different. <laughs> so different, right? right. <laughs> if we picked up doTERRA and both of us used it, I may love it, you may hate it. Right. You know, right. and it doesn't mean that all natural products are going to be bad, all natural hair products. It just means it worked for Cassie but not for Angela. Right, right. Yeah. And I think, too, just being open to, just like you try different uh, commercial products, sure. you know, being open to trying different organic, you know, or natural products. Yeah. Um, you have to be understand that that's going to be part of the process. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I really wish those types of products had more sample sizes mm-hmm. so that we could try things out like that more. You know, the mm-hmm. one-ounce sizes? Oh, yeah. that Yeah, because yeah, that's not something that you see very often, No, and they are expensive. They and are if you don't expensive. like it, you have a whole bottle. Right. <laughs> and then what? You know? Well, now, the one thing about, I will say about the products at Whole Foods, is if you keep your receipt, you yes. can take it back. You have 30 days to try that product. I think that's a wonderful, that's, that's right. Yeah, and I want to say the same thing with, is it Fresh Time? That, yeah. I, you know what? I haven't I haven't been there a lot. Yeah, do they do that too? They do that too. Okay. Yeah, as long as you keep that receipt, I think you have thirty days to take it back. And That's so, great. So you know, you really. So I may be able to find it less expensive somewhere else, but I will go there just if it's something try. I've never tried. Yeah, yeah, smart. Yeah, because quite honestly, um, like you said, they're very. Some of them so can be expensive. quite expensive, yeah. but um, the long again, you're saving money long term, right? You know, and yep. you're taking care of your health. Yep, That's a great idea. And you know, I mean. Gosh, it's like you could get together with some friends and you could all try different things out and pass it around. I, I definitely have a lot of friends that think that way and feel and we often, hey, I didn't this didn't work for me, do you want it? Right. Hey, this didn't work for me, do you want it? And we just constantly giving each other stuff back and yeah. forth. And that's where I get half my oh, favorite right. brands. You oh, know? most definitely. Yeah. yeah. If it's I I have to laugh because I have a client that I train and we're always um <laughs> yeah. talking about hair products because she has curly hair as yeah. well and we're and we're, you know, we're exchanging products, you sure. know, because I say, it didn't work for me, doesn't work for you. So right. her hair texture is a little different than mine. Right. So, um, but we, <laughs> we've we often said that we could literally open up a store with all the hair products that uh-huh. we've accumulated over yes. the time. So. Yep. I've noticed that with my move. I'm like, where did I get all this stuff? You know, all these different <laughs> products. And yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> So now, um, let me ask you this. We, you know, we, we talked about the chemical cleaners as well as personal care products. And so we um, mentioned that you can get some of these at store. At the store, you can also make your own um, right. personal care products um, as well as uh, tooth, uh, your um, toothpaste. Toothpaste. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did, have you, uh, do you use natural deodorant? <laughs> so I have, and okay. I do. And it's been about 15 years of doing that. Okay. It's not a perfect science. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not perfect. So I have this, uh, actually, even in my keynote talk around my book that I give, I have like a whole 20 minutes just talking about this. And one of the things that I think is so wonderful about our body is our body is so smart and knows how to detox for us, mm-hmm. right? And the way it does that is through sweating. Mm-hmm. And so sweating is literally the mechanism that we use to remove toxins from our body. Mm-hmm. And here we are as the really smart Americans we are, and we decide we're going to stop that process, right, 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 by putting deodorant on. So we call it deodorant, but actually the majority of deodorant on the shelves are antiperspirant and deodorant combined. So the antiperspirant okay. is actually what stops you from sweating, okay. and the deodorant is what covers the smell. 
Okay. So, but we just, as a society, call it deodorant, right? But right. those are typically the two pieces inside of a deodorant. So it's the antiperspirant, typically, that is the problem. In problem, meaning health problem, right. not not body odor problem. Right, right yeah. So, <laughs> and so um, when, when we stop using the antiperspirant, what happens is we're going to start perspiring more right. than we had in a long time. Um, and I always tell people, like, if you... If you work a nine to five job and it's going to be really tough to go to work without antiperspirant on, I get that. You don't want to be the stinky person, you know. Like, here she comes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I got to be honest. Like it's I've been that person girl. a lot. Look, it's Cassie. Here she comes. She's going to smell like oil and sweat, you know. And it's like you got to be really careful. Like know when it makes sense. So, right, right. So like. Something that always gets me is being in a gym locker room right. and watching women putting deodorant on or antiperspirant before they go work out. Right. I'm like, this is the one place you're allowed to sweat. Right. You know what I mean? Or <laughs> like, thinking. yeah, or you're going to the beach. This is the one place you're allowed to sweat. It's okay to sweat. So like times like that, maybe that's the beginning phase. Right. You know, if people want to start cutting back. Um, but natural deodorants aren't always the best. I mm -hmm. mean, they, they definitely try to cover up a smell. And quite often the way to do that is with really strong oil smells. And then it's, you know, it's like that patchouli smell or, you know, and there's something associated with that smell, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our minds and in our society. <laughs> I still choose to do it, but right. I got to be honest, I, it doesn't stop me from sweating and it doesn't stop me from smelling. So I, I make a point of always carrying around, and I have one in my bag right now, <laughs> right. a little cloth to always clean myself. And right. I literally will take like sometimes two showers a day, maybe three showers a day. Right. But I think it's so important to keep this area clean. Mm -hmm. And specifically with women in breast health, yeah. like that's something that I really, really take seriously. I've had, I was just talking to you about it, you know, yeah. some issues in my life with that. And I want to keep those ducts clean. I want to keep those lymph nodes clean. I want to keep things moving. So I choose to like just deal with the consequences of no deodorant. <laughs> but it's not always easy. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, no. it's something we have to be careful. And you can wear loose shirts to get around that you know right. what I mean there's yeah. a lot of things that <laughs> strategies let's say I, I have some it. strategies <laughs> but yeah th those are quite toxic and it's yeah. quite scary what they can do to the body oh yeah and if you go online and and, and google it yeah it will, it will scare you right yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not and pretty will, yeah. and the other thing a lot of people don't talk about specifically you know obviously feminine products but um tampons oh right right yeah I mean a lot of these tampons are actually dipped in bleach to make mm -hmm. them white to make that cop cotton ultra white and so we are putting tampons in us that have bleach in them. That is right. scary. Very scary. That skin is so sensitive. It can absorb anything and everything put in it. I just don't like it. Um, so I use all natural tampons, and basically you can see organic. They, they call them organic. Right. That means they're not dipped. And that sometimes means the cotton will be a little bit less white. It'll like have a brown hue to it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. That's Still okay. Still totally yeah. absorbent. Well, it's, you know, no one's going to be looking at it. <laughs> right. Yep. That's right. No one will see it. Let's hope. <laughs> Let's hope that just goes right away. But yeah, no, that's that's a scary thing that doesn't get a lot of attention. Yeah. And now I was very pleased to see this. CVS is now carrying organic cat, they do. cotton tampons. They yeah, they do have them. Yeah, made yes. me really happy. Yeah, yeah, and that's the one thing I do love is I am seeing a lot of those conventional stores kind of transitioning yes. and you know offering more organic products because sometimes that's the one thing that would be so frustrating. I'd have to drive across town, right, to go to where it's closed. Yeah, it's closed. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's nice to have more options, right. So now we, we've been talking about the chemical cleaners, cleaners as well as personal care products. Um, what else can we do to support help in our homes? You know, having clean water is very yeah. important in our homes. Um, with, with me just currently in the process of moving and buying a new home, the very first thing I did, literally day two of owning that home, was I put a reverse osmosis system in my home. Mm -hmm. So important to me. The reason I think it's so important, um, so I actually worked at a, steel processing plant for many years where I was in charge of the wastewater treatment. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And so I learned a lot about water. Um, quite often, So what happens is we, we, let's say at this plant use, let's say five major chemicals, right? So we would, when we dumped them, and I use that word very seriously, we dumped chemicals. What happened is let's say one is hydrochloric acid. We would have to dump equal amounts of caustic with that hydrochloric acid to balance the pH. Wow. Yeah. So that's how the government, that's how our world works, right? So when a huge plant, a chemical plant, dumps chemicals, they have to equalize it with the right. opposite chemicals. So not only are you dumping the oh. chemical, you're dumping double. And this goes down the drain. Wow. Okay. So my job there, too, was to work with the um, water department. What they did was they came out and they would take samples from our water, mm -hmm. um, you know, twice a week. And it was always unannounced. We never knew when it was. They wanted to make sure we were doing everything right. And we always were very, very lucky. We had owners that were very serious about the environment and never, you know, I mean, they, they spent tons of money to make sure we did it right. And I commend them for that. Um, but 
what would happen was I would get dinged at the plant for chemicals that were not in our process. Okay. So okay. what does that tell you? Mm-hmm. They're on the incoming water, which is our drinking water. Okay. Scary stuff, right? Yeah. So when you start taking water, so we started taking the incoming water to analyze it to prove that it wasn't us. Okay. Right? This is coming into it. But that's the same water going to the drinking fountain. Right. That's the same water going to your kitchen sink. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's scary. So that's when, like, the light bulb went off in my head. Mm-hmm. And this was quite some time ago, a few de- couple decades ago. And um, that's when I got really serious about my house water and got a reverse osmosis system. The more I looked into it, the more I realized there's also tons of pharmaceuticals in our water, and they don't, mm-hmm. they can't get them out. So what do you, what right. do most people do when they're halfway through a pharmaceutical? Because people are flushing their, yep. they're flushing their drugs. That's down right. The, um, and they tell medication. you to do that, so children can't get to them, or so you know, whatever, it doesn't go in the garbage and accidentally mm-hmm. hurt someone, but it's going into our water supply. Right. And the theory is, then it's spread out amongst so much water, you hardly get it. But there are like sometimes huge hits of Prozac or you know, right. I mean, mind altering yeah. drugs in our water. And so there's just a lot going on in our water. And I would rather be more careful than not. And so the reverse osmosis system is important to me as well um, because the drinking water comes out clean, but Mm -hmm. also the showering water. Right, right. And one of the things people forget about, and I know people that are very, very, very concerned about their drinking water, and they make sure they always drink the right water, and and then they shower in city water. And our Mm -hmm. skin is the largest organ on our body. It is. Yeah, and so we absorb a lot through it. And Mm -hmm. especially if you think about when you go get a facial, Mm -hmm. the first thing they do is steam your face to open the pores. Right, which is steamy. It's exactly what we do in the shower. Right. We steam ourselves, we open our pores, and then we use city water, probably, Mm -hmm. you know, and who knows what's in it. You know, let's, let's hope everything's kosher and we're good, but maybe not, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's another way to kind of take your own power back Mm -hmm. around, you know, water and being able to drink it clean. Um, If in fact you don't have the budget or the desire to put a reverse osmosis in, those can be anywhere from $5,000 to $7,000. That's a lot. So it is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I totally understand. Um, But you you can do things like you can get a filter on your sink. You can get Mm -hmm. a filter on your shower. They sell them. They're maybe a hundred, not even dollars, Walmart, Costco, Amazon, I mean, they're everywhere now, which is wonderful. Um, so you could put that on your, your shower, you could put it on your drain, you know, or your um, bathtub nozzle, you can put it on your drinking, and that's a really great alternative. And you're still going to get probably 70 to 85% of the toxins out as long as you're changing the filter. Oh, yeah. You know, it's <laughs> funny. I actually had um, Dr. Wee, uh, Wee from um, the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and that was one of the things that he, he really um, highlighted yes. the importance of changing your filters. Most yeah. forget. Yeah, You know, and next thing you know, you're putting it through, like Brita, for example. (laughs) You know, and all of a sudden it's like, when was the last time you changed your Brita? Uh, I don't know, six months ago? It's not working anymore. It's not working anymore. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) might be keeping it cold in the fridge, but it's not getting rid of those toxins. Right. Yeah, so it's important to change the filter. And, of course, we can always buy water. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, for drinking. Right, for drinking. Yeah, yeah. it'd be pretty expensive to fill your tub with that. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But I I do love the suggestion to put the filters on the shower heads as well as the bathtub. Yep. Um, faucet as well as in your sink. I mean, again, that's just that's three steps that you've taken to yes. purify your water. Yes, mm-hmm. and it will help a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's a lot going on there that we can do. So, you know, when you're thinking about store bought water, you know, there's so many options out there anymore. It's right. a little confusing and overwhelming. But you know, you think about it. There's the alkaline water, right? And basically, and we hear this often where they're talking about alkaline water and touting the benefits of it, anti cancer, and you know, helps heal mm-hmm. the body. Um, and if we think about what's happening, and, and most people you know, may or may not understand this, but there's a pH scale. Right. And on one side is alkaline and the other side is acid. Right. And that's why when I was talking about the chemicals, we had to re- put the two together right. to be in the middle. So the body should be about seven, mm-hmm. right? So quite often um, we're not, we're not, we're way more um, acidic. Right. And so that, that has a lot to do with the way we eat, you know, processed foods, not mm-hmm. enough fruits and vegetables. Um, so alkaline water is effective in bringing our pH back to that seven, right. which they say that disease, specifically cancer, cannot live in the body if it's alkaline. Okay. So that's why a lot of people go after the alkaline water right. um, when they're they're looking to, you know, heal themselves. Right. And so that's what that basically is. It is very expensive, and people have often ask me, is it worth it? Well, it's really cheap to be able to get a little tester. There's these little well, tiny test strips. Well, I was going to say, you should probably test and yeah. see what your pH actually you is got it. before you decide to make that purchase. Yep, mm-hmm. and they're about, you know, five, ten bucks. You can get them on Amazon. They literally take saliva or urine, and they tell you what your pH is. And if you are very acidic, that's a that's a pretty good spend, mm-hmm. that alkaline water. Right. But if you are already at the desired point of 7, I think so. it's 7.1 or 7.2. Right. Um, but if you're already there, that's a waste of money for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that's important to understand. Um, you know, purified, there's the reverse 
reverse osmosis, which we've already talked about. Right. Um, there's also, you know, distilled, which is when they steam it, and okay. they actually then remove the, t- the chemicals that way. So that's all purified means. Right, but the distilled is not something that you should drink. Well, it can, oft- it can pull minerals out of your body right. because what happens is you steamed it, and so you pulled everything out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so many would argue it's not a good thing to drink, mm-hmm. and I do agree with that. Mm-hmm. But you have to know, like, you have to look. Because right. quite often purified, it could mean either one of those, reverse osmosis or distilled. Right. So you have to, like, look, well, how did they do this? You know, yeah. and so it makes sense. And another thing that we often don't see, we, purified water, it's just tap water put through a reverse osmosis system. Mm-hmm. So essentially what I have in my house, they're right. bottling it and selling it to people. Right, you're right. <laughs> you know? You're right, right. And, I mean, it's great, but, right. you know, yeah, I mean, it's not a whole lot more than, and if you start thinking about it, if you buy one of those a day at a dollar or two dollars, mm-hmm. how long would it take you to do your house? Oh, most definitely. You know, that's not a good, really I like that. That, that's, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, because yeah. chance, chances are you probably buy more than just one bottle a day if oh, that's what you drink. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah. you reduce the exposure to um, plastics when you're going to do it in your own home. Right. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot, of, a lot that can happen there. But you know, spring water is very good too. And spring right. water literally means it was taken out of a spring. Mm-hmm. That could also mean a well. Mm-hmm. Um, but spring water is is good. The only problem with spring water is. You don't know where that spring came from. Right, right. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if it's in like a heavy manufacturing area, and that's where you want to look at sourced or bottled by. Mm-hmm. And it'll actually have that on there. Right. Um, we have a huge company here in Michigan, Absopure. Right. Yeah. And they do spring water. Um, typically, from what I know, I think their spring is in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly, you know, how often they test for contaminants and, you know, those types of things. But think about the plant I was just telling you right. about. Right. Yeah. So if they had bottled in the Detroit area where that plant was not quite sure that would have been the best water and I wouldn't be right. paying for that you yeah. know but when you think about uh, uh, what the artesian ones you know right. like the Fiji or you know those things yeah I, I would trust that water a lot more than I trust something from Plymouth right you know? <laughs> I mean yeah. there, there's just a lot going on there but then on the flip side the ones from Fiji have been in plastic bottles right for God knows how long going yeah. hot cold hot cold right. which is what releases the bad parts inside of the plastic Most definitely. so there's just a lot a lot going on and it's almost like you have to know what you're looking for and what you need mm-hmm. in in your water to mm-hmm. be able to make you healthy and of course then the next big thing is sparkling waters are getting more and more common right which is great as a matter of fact I, I have two say, right. I know I'm like obsessed I do love them i really do well this one i'm kind of obsessed with so this is new your your bay okay and i think they're from the detroit area actually but um what they are is they're enhanced with um uh caffeine so it's like a cup of coffee a little bit of a little boost yeah and they get it from green tea okay which is pretty cool so i'm like oh okay i like that i'm this is my new fun product Uh, they just had it at costco and we're giving out samples and i loved it so i bought a case okay yeah but (laughs) i'm new on that yeah yeah and it worked um but they're you know sparkling waters are nice it helps replace sodas Mm -hmm. which i really like um but it it doesn't exactly hydrate us right right so we need to be careful i think yeah i I often recommend the classes you can do sparkling water drink that's an addition to the water yeah it doesn't count yeah whereas that 64 ounces or whatever your ounce count is Yeah. yeah And something I think I think is important to um, highlight is the importance of not if you are going to do bottled plastic, especially the plastic, if yes. you do bottled water, especially in plastic um, bottles, it's really important to know where they're stored. That yes. They're not stored outside. 100%. Do not. I always tell clients do not bring in bottled waters that you've had in your car. Right. You know, sitting out there in the heat. Yep. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know what's scary about it though is we only see what we see. Yes, you have no idea where that water, yeah. yeah. Where it got bottled, where how it was trucked, if it was in a refrigerated truck or temperature controlled of some type or not. Yes, did it sit not. in a warehouse for six months, right. hot, cold, you know? Did the gas station put it in, you know, in the sun out in the back mm-hmm. area? Did the, You know what I mean? There's a lot going on. Right. So it's like if for some reason you're worried about estrogen and you're fighting something like that, then maybe just stay away from the plastic completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, believe it or not, we're almost at the end. Wow. So why is it so important to stay hydrated, if you could say that very Yeah, quickly? I mean, three out of four Americans are dehydrated chronically. Mm-hmm. And the scary thing about that is, you know, that, that creates foggy head. It creates memory problems. It creates hunger pains. People, when they're thirsty, actually have hunger pains. So they think that they're hungry. Right. And they'll go eat. It adds to calories. You know, it, it doesn't assist with weight loss. Um, you know, if you think about a pool... Right. So we have a backyard pool and all the leaves fall in it in the fall. And you can either take a net and get those leaves out while the water's in it, or you drain the water and try to clean those leaves when they're stuck against the back of the pool, right, with no water. That's how I equate to what's happening in the body with detoxifying. Mm. So we have toxins floating around our system. If we're hydrated enough, that water is going to take them and 
take them out through us, right. right? We urinate them out. They come out through our bowels. It's a wonderful process. Our body's intelligent. It knows how to deal with toxins. Right. But if we're dehydrated, what happens? Mm-hmm. It gets stuck in your body, right? Yeah. And they lodge in certain areas, and that's where disease begins. So I find it very, very important to get people to understand that concept and know how important it is to completely hydrate, constantly you know, put water in their body and be able to um, detoxify that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that the human body is made 70% of water. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which most is lost through urine and sweat. Mm-hmm. Um, water flushes bacteria out of the bladder. It aids digestion, carries nutrients and oxygen to the cells, prevents constipation, maintains the electric, electrolyte sodium balance. Right. Um, yet any, you know, many people under, underestimate the importance of being hydrated. That's so right. that's why I really want to highlight that. Yeah. And you actually have a, uh, you actually quite a talk, talk quite a bit bit about the importance of hydration absolutely mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think i think probably the majority of our diseases could be eliminated by actually drinking the right water and when i say diseases i don't mean the major major mm-hmm. ones right. but the majority of things you know i mean that's why they say when you have the flu or the cold hydrate hydrate drink water drink mm-hmm. liquids you know and sometimes that's even they're okay with you drinking sugary liquids because they just want you to have some type of liquid running through right. your body to help eliminate that yeah, and it's amazing how many people don't drink water throughout the day. They, I, I, I can't tell you how many clients all the time people say that to me. Remind me, yeah. like, how could you not drink water? People say to me, I never drink water. Yeah, like, well, well, you do. It's in a lot of the stuff you're drinking, you know. Right. But yeah, no, it's not healthy to not drink water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's important. Anything that you want to share um, before we uh, part ways? Because we're almost at the end. I can't believe this. Yeah, no, I, I think we touched on some really great things here. I think, you know, we always just want to be considering what's in our environment, considering mm-hmm. how to reduce the exposure to toxins. And thank you for having me on and for this show. It's wonderful. Yeah, she you're so welcome. This is Angela Moore of Empire on 9th and Superstation. Please tune in next Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. Look me up on AngelaTMore.com. Take care. God bless. She praises. An image she prays to be sculpted by the sculptor. Oh, she don't see the light that's shining. Deeper than the eyes can find it. Maybe we are made of blind souls. She tries to cover up her pain and cut her woes away. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer night. It's pajamas with feet. And everybody over for Sunday dinner. And that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of. This is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself. So you can save on repairs. Because home is your place. Your memories. Your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable. A free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE. Or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Put your health care career on the fast track at Wayne County Community College District with 20 degree and certificate programs in nursing and allied health, surgical assistance, emergency medical technology, dental hygiene, and more. Exciting opportunities to advance your career are just one click away. And with world-class facilities, experienced faculty, and hands-on training opportunities, you'll get everything you need to succeed in the growing health care field. So why wait? Visit wccd.edu and register today. 910 AM Superstation is the voice of Detroit and the talk of the town. Weekdays, weeknights, weekends, and everything in between. If you want national topics, we have it. Is this DACA challenge that the president has presented? He rolled back the... He hasn't done it yet. Anybody who says that they know what he's going to do before it happens is making (laughs) a mistake. Local discussions. We have that too. You know, the Pistons, the Red Wings, those arenas, they were made for people primarily in the suburbs, I think, coming in. Entertainment and relationships? Listen up. And if you thought we were restricted to only the radio, think again. You can hear all of this on 910 AM as well as on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, YouTube Live, YouTube Red, and Facebook Live. That's right. Download the 910 AM Superstation app in the Apple, Android, or Windows App Store today and stay connected to the best station in town. 
910 AM Superstation is the voice of the people. Don't believe me? Just listen. I love 910 AM. I listen all day long. So many articulate and thoughtful, diverse voices and wonderful stories. I always head to the 910 AM website for the latest in entertainment news, community events, and more. So when you think of 910 AM Superstation, we want you to tune in, call in, and don't forget to find us on social media. 910 AM Superstation is the voice of the people. Don't believe me? Just listen. I absolutely love this radio station. This station gets me through the work week. And we don't just show love to the callers. We see the comments and the posts, too. I'm always on the go. So being able to watch all my favorite hosts on 910 AM mobile app is amazing. So when you think of 910 AM Superstation, we want you to tune in, call in, and don't forget to find us on social media. Three, two, one. You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. The future of radio. You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. The best in the city. The future of radio. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit. 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. 